Um, good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Banzi, a professor in the School of Architecture at UT Austin. And I'm a CAD advisory board member of the Center for American Architecture and Design. I'll say a few words about the center before I turn it over to our speakers for today's lunch forum. The mission of CAD is to provide a platform for collaborative, critical scholarship across disciplines at the school. And I might add that it's also an opportunity, these lunch forums, to have a conversation about the work that uh, our faculty and students are doing. So there'll be an opportunity to ask questions uh, online. You'll see uh, in the chat, feel free to uh, ask a question anytime during your presentations. We'll come to it at the end after the presentations will ask. But if you have a comment about uh, the work, you can add those too, because in the best of situations, we're really having a conversation here. Um, let me uh, say a few words about uh, the speakers today. Robert Stepnowski is a senior lecturer at the University of Texas here. His current research focuses on the use of UV, UAVs for mapping and model, modeling paired with information technologies for analysis and site discovery, specifically using the UAV to generate aerial photography and video capture of a site at varying altitude, and then all of the data that is collected in that way. Um, He's also has been involved in and in, in working in, in research involving virtual and augmented reality. It's another part of his research and scholarly work. The process of translating BIM models in a virtual information modeling environment provides the opportunity to experience the model virtually and reveal the depth of information embedded in it. So I'm going to leave it uh, there. And since both of our speakers will be talking back to back, I'd also like to introduce Rashmi Ghazari, um, who is a third year PhD, uh, an architecture student here at UT. Her research interest is in the application of emerging technologies for heritage management, specifically 3D scanning and modeling of historic structures. She has a bachelor's in architecture from India a master's in historic preservation and planning from the city and regional planning department at Cornell University, and a master's in digital humanities from the Universita Caposcati in Venezuela. So I'll uh, turn it over to uh, them for this uh, conversation about the material, virtual, and reconstructed works, 3D modeling of historic preservation. Welcome. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Friday Lunch Forum. We would like to thank uh, the Center for American Architecture and Design for giving us this platform. Today, we are going to share this talk. I will begin, Rob will continue, then I'll speak, and he will end the talk. The title is Material, Virtual, and Reconstructed Worlds with a focus on 3D um, digital modeling and historic preservation. Um, so this is a quote from Carlo Ratti and Matthew Claudin's book, 2016 book, The City of Tomorrow. Uh, it says, we live in an increasingly digital world where the physical space we inhabit is now blanketed with a virtual dimension repeat with data. They point to the overlap of the material and the virtual in our everyday lives. We see it in wayfinding measures like Waze and Google Map, Maps, which are now indispensable for us. We also see sensors embedded in, in new buildings. They give us the information about the behavior of the building as signals. We also see new buildings that are built to respond to digital stimuli. So this world that we know is changing, whether it's buildings or humans, and we have more and more hybrid entities now, which are becoming norm than an exception. So in the field of historic preservation as well, these boundaries are blurry more we see 3D scanning and modeling uh, used over many decades, but now it's becoming affordable and accessible. Many organizations like SciArc and uh, Econem, they're recording heritage structures all over the world. And as most law suggests, with uh, convergent advances in machine learning, 
and also in artificial intelligence. This technology of using 3D uh, technology, uh, scanning and modeling for historic preservation is going to see an exponential growth in the near future. So we see this happening in the field of medicine and it will be there in the field of historic preservation as well. In today's talk, Rob and I, we will discuss some current and some proposed uses of this technology. So for historic preservation, um, we look at various cases from that of an object to projects that attempt the reconstruction of worlds. Rob will start by explaining the process of 3D modeling in itself and as applied to some historic structures. I will continue to talk with projects that use these models for various applications, such as rematerializing the digitals. Um, or the use of preemptive documentation uh, in post disaster reconstructions. And also, um, I'll end with virtual world. So, Rob, welcome. Thanks so much. All right, I'm going to start out with a, a quote and then take us into the next steps. How do you document a stark site, an object, a building, interiors? topography or machines for that matter at a high level of accuracy giving us a permanent snapshot in time we have some fascinating technology to share world heritage sites and a history lesson as an added bonus today i'll begin by looking at methods of site acquisition and the tools that support it along with case studies uh, that use the workflows <laughs> These are methods of site acquisition. What I'm speaking about today is through laser scanning with LIDAR, which is light detection and ranging, as well as photogrammetry, both aerial and terrestrial. <clears> 3D <throat> laser scanning. Our line of sight is so important um, to have accurate workflows. So where are the blind spots? What can the scanner, scanner see? In this example, we have the Miller Tower, which offers a unique set of challenges and capturing the interior, which is very tight, and the exterior space. How to connect those spaces proved to be a challenge during the post processing. One of the scanner, um, during the scanner setup, call out scanning and then go high, because you do not want to be in that model. What is LiDAR anyway? LiDAR is light detection and ranging, using lasers to measure the elevation of features. It's a distance technology that samples um, with an incredible amount of accuracy and points. It's similar to sonar or radar because it sends a pulse and measures uh, the time it takes to return, but LIDAR is different than sonar and radar because it uses light. In this example, you see aerial photogrammetry using a drone to capture a site. Um, flight pattern choices are made depending upon the site and features of interest. Um, the image you're seeing on the left is Mueller Tower here in Austin, and choices on the right using drone software. Taking a brief look at the FAA and what rules to follow when considering an aerial site assessment, you're flying a drone in, in the national airspace so to capture that historic structure. You want to be careful when flying that bird up, up in the sky. So here we are to name a few bullet points, not above 400 feet. Keep your uh, UAV in line of sight and don't fly in that list of <coughs> rules. Moving on, that's a few uh, common flight patterns uh, using UAV for site acquisition are grid, double grid, and orbital patterns depending upon the site. It may be necessary to combine each of these to provide adequate coverage and documentation. Understanding what flight pattern for to fly to gather enough information uh, causes you to look at a site's features with a different set of eyes. Multiple orientations are seen here using both aerial and terrestrial photogrammetry to capture the entire building. <clears throat> this is the gear I use for terrestrial photogrammetry. A smartphone at the most basic tool provides uh, enough resolution to capture small objects such as a small fountain or planter, um, but can capture something as large as the first story of a building facade. GoPro is something I use when I need a fisheye lens to capture more of the uh, surrounding area. And DSLR is my tool of choice with multiple lens options and control over focus, ISO, light, and color depth. The all important process of image overlap uh, to capture building facades or say features or whatever you're up to, you want to be sure that overlap is enough. Uh, two to three image overlap is a rule of thumb. The necessary steps of image capture and overlap for each shot 
as we progress along and feature our or facade, it might look like this. Here's the School of Architecture's Sutton Hall. It's a familiar site around here and a great example of learning the steps and attention to detail it takes to document a building. It can take hundreds or thousands of images to accurately capture the feature. Next stop is the Sea Home Power Plant Intake Building where LIDAR terrestrial and aerial photogrammetry were used to capture the entire site. A crucial element of a successful photogrammic process is obtaining a good photographic sequence. Good photographic sequences are based on a few simple rules of camera angle and overlap. What you're seeing in this image is an image path around the interior of building C at the intake uh, power plant, DSLR on the floor, and a drone around the upper perimeter of the interior. This kind of photogrammetry, <clears throat> the camera is in a stationary position at an elevated level. The tilt and other specs of the camera are all controlled to capture the maximum amount of information through the lens. The underlying principle of terrestrial photogrammetry is in the directions of the same object. Photographs from two extremes are of a known measurement. Their position can be located by the intersection of two rays to the same object. The terrestrial side step workflow of the interior space of building C, of C home power plant, what's required to um, generate several inner loops to ensure the machinery objects were captured so they are included in the point cloud model. Machinery objects themselves were relics of the building. Adding a level of accuracy, the black light pixel targets seen in this image are used in 3D laser scanning of aerial and terrestrial photogrammetry. In this view, we are seeing through the eyes of the drone flying very close to the ceiling in order to capture the surfaces of the upper concrete ledge conditions. Not something that could be seen by the DSLR camera or through the laser scanner. So when you cannot reach it, fly it. In this view, we are, I am in the lower chambers of the C1 building. Definitely a creepy space to be in. Um, black, what, black white pixel targets are placed at each threshold to connect each space during those processing. Seeing through the lens, in this case, a low light tripod is used to allow the aperture and ISO to be open and capture more light. There's a fine balance to find here where if there's too much noise in the images due to lack of light, the densified point cloud will show data loss. If capturing a historic site causes you to look at the space differently. To capture each corner, each ledge, and keep an area, the lens does not, if the lens cannot see it, it cannot be modeled. I have three case studies for you, and here's our history lesson. <coughs> Three case studies start, uh, which take advantage of both LIDAR and photogrammetry. We have Chichen Ellis Island, and Monasteria of Regard. We start with Chichen Itza from the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Um, just an amazing view here. UAV flights are here are only allowed with a special permit. I looked into it, and legally, it is no go for me. One of Chichen Itza's most conspicuous structures is a massive nine level pyramid, 90 feet high by 180 feet wide, in the center of a large plaza named El Castillo or the castle. At the spring and fall equinoxes, the setting, uh, setting sun casts undulating shadows on the stairway, forming bodies of the serpent heads carved at the base of the north balustrades, pointing towards the sacred cenote. After warfare and environmental crisis led to the abandonment of the lowland Mayan city states around uh, 800 CE, the focus of the Maya civilizations shifted north to the Yucatan Peninsula. Chichen Itza was a Mayan capital flourishing from the 19th, 19th century, or 13th century, sorry, likely named after the deep cenote that was sacred to Maya. I haven't been to Chichen Itza just yet, but I have been to Kobat Temple and it's incredibly steep. The stone steps were perfectly polished uh, from all of the visitors over time. No railings to hang on to, just a rope bolted to the stone. Uh, the views were extraordinary from the top and you could see for miles and miles of climb at your own risk. This is a LiDAR view of the interior of the cenote. The point cloud model offers you a view you would otherwise not ever be able to see. One of the principal cities of this period was Chichen Itza, which means at the mouth of the well of Itza, and they refer to the deep cenote or sinkhole at the site um, that was sacred to Maya. 
kind of shifting around the side a bit, that ritual ball game was one of the defining characteristics of the Mesoamerican society and was a common subject in Mesoamerican art. Chichen Itza's ball court is the largest, uh, the largest in all of Mesoamerica, Mesoamerica at 508 feet in length and bounded by walls reaching over 30 feet in height. It was generally played on a long rec uh, rectangular court with a large, solid, heavy rubber ball using their elbows, knees, or hips, but not their hands. Heavily padded players directed the ball toward a goal or marker. Large stone rings set in the walls of the court, about 25 feet above the field, and served as goals. In this view, the surviving ball court of Etchisnitsa was about the size of a modern football field. The game may have had religious and political significance. It is featured in creation stories and was sometimes associated with warfare. So notice in this light, LIDAR cloud, scanning locations, and radiation of the field. Along with El Castillo is the Caracol. Originally a cylindrical shape with a domed roof, the Caracol is a stone structure now partially ruined. Narrow windows cut into the outer walls seem to have been designed in order to observe the irregular movements of Venus, which was considered to be the sun's twin and held great significance for the Maya, particularly in decisions pertaining to the war. The staircase at the front of the Caracol faces 27 and a half degrees north of west, perfectly in line with the northern positional extreme of Venus and producing alignments at the buildings northeast and southeast corners that track both summer and winter solstices. Caracol is one of the oldest standing observatories in the Americas and highlights uh, the great importance of astrological phenomena held for the people of Chisinza. Just discovering the planned views of these point clouds, interesting similarities in the staircase tower structures of the Wildflower Center on the left and Caracol on the right. Next stop, Ellis Island. United States Immigration Station at Ellis Island, established in 1892, was the most prominent federal immigration facility after a fire destroyed the original wood buildings. In 1897, Ellis Island was expanded and approved by a series of landscape, uh, landfill projects and monumental new buildings still there today. The U.S. Public Health Service conducted medical inspections of immigrants and operated two major hospital complexes on Ellis Island. So you can check you're doing well. One main hospital for general medical care and another uh, designated for patients' diseases, immigrants, and other U.S. public health service patents. Patients have uh, received the highest standard of medical care on Ellis Island from 1901 until the hospital's closed in 1951. Historic American Building Survey has been working on a multi phase project documenting the Ellis Island hospitals and associated buildings and met, uh, with metric drawings, historical reports, and large format photographs. Each building has been scanned with both LIDAR and photogrammetry for full detail. Notice the black circle to the right. This is the 3D laser scanner location in the shadows of the trees around it. The trees themselves have been classified out of the model for a clear view of the building. Historic American Building Survey uh, administered by Heritage Documentation Programs of the National Park Service is the federal government's oldest preservation program. The trees being classified out of the model makes for an interesting view and story of the building image itself. Video for you here. The animated fly through of Ellis Island landscape is comprised of point clouds from more than 60 individual laser scan stations combined and textured with HDR panoramic photogrammetry photogram data. This will take us around the entire outside of the site itself. It's about a minute, I think. Just a time, I'll continue on. The next one is interesting. Let this one fly. The animated fly through of the main hospital buildings is comprised of data from more than 180 individual laser scan stations. And they're combined with a textured and uh, combined and textured with HDR panoramic photogrammetry data. The rendering of more than 1.7 billion data points was done using point tools, point cloud animation software. And this is a great example of documenting a space which is hazardous and abandoned, and we shouldn't be there in the first place. This is um, the subterranean levels documenting 
grid texture, destruction, and abandonment over the years. <clears throat> Next up, Monastery of Regard. Surrounded by towering cliffs, Monastery of Regard is located in the Kotik province of Armenia at the entrance of the Azad Valley. Nearly half of the Gurdard complex is carved into the mountainside. Uh, the medieval church itself dates back to 1215 with an intricately carved interior. More than 20 buildings are carved out of the mountainside, ranging in size and complexity from churches, tombs, uh, monasteries, and chapels. Reskin scanning technology would provide a creative way of data archiving and preserve this site as a point cloud in time. Looking the interior and exterior scans would place the carved interior spaces, as you can see here in section drawing. Here we have students on site at the Monastery of Gagard capturing the site all the LIDAR, and yes, they are doing this in the snow. Through the laser scanning and close range hand scanning, with an RTEX scanner, provide the opportunity of a virtual tour. Thumbnails on each image here. Show the GPS, GPS located scan positions. <clears throat> Rock cut churches and tombs at Gagard sit at the head of the Azat Valley, as shown here in the 3D perspective point cloud image. Colors applied to study height, texture, and surface. This elevational view of the laser scan data shows the entire monastery enclosure at Gagard. Perspective image of 3D laser scan data situates the monastery at the guard amidst the towering cliffs in which the church and tombs are carved. All right. This is where I hand off Rashmi. Right. So I am going to talk about the application of 3D scanning and modeling in historic preservation at different scales. So we saw how the material world can be captured into the digital from uh, raw stock until now. In uh, practice, we are reconstructing worlds or we start with an object going to a structure to a world using both virtual and physical models and a combination of both. Let's see how. So in, um, in my talk, I have three parts. One will be rematerializing the digitized. Second, we'll talk about preemptive documentation that is used for reconstruction. And third would be uh, a current trend in virtual world making. These are some of the images from Ellis Island um, that Rob just showed us. Photogrammetry was used to scan some of these details. And as he suggested, there are parts where people should not go because they are hazardous or restricted. So there's a virtual tool that was generated using these scans on any side. This is um, a 20th century facsimile of the famous 16th century painting, The Wedding Feast at Kana. So for 235 years, this uh, painting by Veronese, it hung in this room that you see here. This is the refectory at the uh, San Giorgio Monastery in Venice. And in the 18th century, the end of 18th century, Soldiers of Napoleon's invading army in Venice, they were plundering Venice. They cut this painting into two to make it easy to transport it to Paris. And currently it's in the collection of, uh, uh, of um, Louvre Museum. So Platinum Foundation scanned the original painting in Louvre, and then they 3D printed it on a purpose-built flatbed printer in their studio in Madrid. So in 2017, the painting was repatriated in the form of a digital reproduction, a facsimile, to be seen once again in the same light that Peronese probably intended as he painted it. This is another pattern uh, project, and you cannot see up there. Uh, this is the tomb of Seti, the first in Egypt. So in 2017, facsimiles of the first two rooms of the tomb of Seti, the Hall of Beauties and the Pillar Hall J, were exhibited by Patton Foundation. So two main processes were used to rematerialize the bas-relief uh, surfaces. Most of the tomb was carved into boards of PU, polyurethane, using CNC milling. The second process used was plaster casting using molds which had been 3D printed. 
The scanned data from the tomb was then printed out using a revolutionary elevated printing technology from Canon production printing. After that, color was printed onto elastic skins, which could then be attached to the routed or passed leaf surfaces. So it was a very complicated process, but the results were wonderful. And going on to reconstruction post-disaster, this is becoming quite common now in historic preservation, whether due to increased uh, frequency in extreme weather events or human strike. In Paris here, it was negligence and accident that caused the fire in April 2019 at the Notre Dame church. As you might know, this fire burned down. This event was broadcast on news channels around the world. But fortunately for us, a 3D digital archive um, has been created over many years during his research by the late professor Andrew Tallon at Vassar College. He used some of the methods Rob described earlier to get very detailed scans of many parts of the church, some which were readily accessible to the public. He combined the data he got with high definition photos to create 3D models. And this is a Spain graph from a news uh, uh, in, uh, on CBS. As I said, it was on all the news channels. So the interior of the cathedral attic had these timber frames that had been nicknamed the forest. And scans of this forest could prove to be very helpful in the reconstruction of, of this fire in the future. This is another source though. Uh, data from uh, gaming industry researchers could also help us here. The, the, this is the Assassin's Creed Unity and um, the gamers, they had modeled the church to use in their game. So all of this digital documentation from various sources, uh, they can be used for, they can provide us with 3D models of the lost portions, some of which can be 3D printed or used in CNC milling operations and so many other ways. This virtual reconstruction can also be used for augmented virtual and mixed reality experiences. It can be when the reconstruction is happening and also post the reconstruction that these models can be used. The next project I talk about is the Palmyra Arch. So this is a two-thirds scale model um, of the arch in Syria that was destroyed by the Islamic State. The 3D reconstruction was carried out by Institute of Digital Archaeology at Oxford University. And that is uh, under that banner, the names. I don't know if you can turn it off. The <coughs> Do you want to talk? You can see the next spot out. That's fine. Okay. Um, so the installation of this arch at various locations uh, around the world. So, so um, I'll just repeat. So, what it said was the Institute of Digital Archaeology at Oxford University. So, this the installation of this arch. Uh, this was done in various places, like in New York, in, um, in London, in Trafalgar Square. This was a mainly symbolic gesture to acknowledge that the losses in war in the war on Syrian uh, region. Now, the same arch uh, was virtually reconstructed here by Econen. It's a Paris-based architecture firm. And you can see it put together virtually again. So this type of reconstruction again can be used for augmented reality applications on site to add missing parts of a structure. So this can be done in the virtual realm and it can present a composite picture for the viewer on site. Now I go to the world making part. So the scale of the reconstruction that we saw today is expanding to that of world making. The screen capture from the virtual Ankur project, um, Professor Tom Plulo from the history department here at UP and Tom Chandler at Monash University in Australia, they are both involved in this, uh, in this virtual recreation of the famous Ankur Wat temple in Cambodia. So they 3D scanned the extant temple and the precincts to use as a base for future modeling. As you can see here, the spires would be glinting from gold. This, this, you can see that um, in the heyday of the Khmer Empire, but now they, there's no gold there. So recreation of a historical past for architectural structures is essentially an extrapolation, although in reverse, by using other sources of information, whether they are descriptions, paintings, photographs, or locational context. 
So in this project, the main focus was less on architecture and more on other anthropological aspects. Nonetheless, the methodology becomes helpful in expanding our understanding of historical times. This is another screen graph. You can see the bar reliefs in the outer gallery corridors of the temple here. So if you go on the site, uh, virtualamco.com, these scenes, they can be moved, uh, turned around in 360 degree angles, to evoke the feeling of being present. So I, I really recommend visiting the site. This is the last project I will talk about today, the mirror world. Um, so in March of 2019, this article in Wired, uh, article by Kevin Kelly called The Mirror World, this became very famous. The cover has a message, welcome to Mirror World, mirror on its cover. So in this article, Kelly says the mirror world doesn't yet fully exist, but it is coming. He continues, someday soon, every place and thing in the real world, every street, lamppost, building and room will have its full size digital twin in the mirror world. It is now three years since this prediction. And with the speed at which currently new technologies are developing, we already hear echoes of proposed metaverses all around the world, from Facebook to Google to Apple, everybody's involved in this. So I will talk about um, this project at EPFL. <coughs> Professor Frederick Kaplan and uh, researcher Isabella Di Leonardo, they, in their article, The Advent of the 4D Mirror World, which is in the 2020 issue of Urban Planning, they propose to build a time index metric model of the past and the future on a planetary scale. So this concept of a 4D mirror world could be considered to be the next planetary scale information platform. And we do know planetary scale information platforms at various scales even now, like Facebook, Twitter, Google. So this 4D mirror world, uh, they hope to provide us with an intuitive interface ideally both for decision makers and citizens to access and using which they will go so they will go backward in the collectively reconstructed past and go forward in a commonly negotiated future interesting words so this project began at the Ecole Polytechnique de Federal in Lausanne as I as I mentioned uh, Professor Kaplan envisioned creating a virtual time machine for the city of Venice that would connect multiple types of digitized data to generate slices of time. The first formal document was signed uh, around 2013 between state archives in Venice, Kaposkari University, and EPFL to create an online accessible repository of digitized archives available for all researchers and community members. That was the first goal. In this first phase, many institutions were involved, some of them from the US, like uh, universities, um, Princeton and Stanford and Columbia did some work. So key concepts, uh, briefly I'll mention them. Uh, they were tackled during the phase one because when you're trying to create a virtual world, you come across many hurdles. And so ETFN has been taking up small chunks of that problem and solving and creating a, a base for future. So they use the big data of the past, referring to historic times when there were surges in recording. Then uh, they digitized books without opening them using X-ray tomography. OCR, optical characterization <laughs> methods, were applied to handwritten texts. They used new programming architectures like uh, convolutional <coughs> networks and so many others. And uh, they came up with this replica search engine. It's also very fascinating. I recommend you to go look more about that. So this is about visual pattern discovery. And we live in this image where we can. Uh, we live in the in, in this uh, era when we can find images of everything and anything. But how do you find what you're looking for? Um, so that is that's wonderful. Now, optry and morphological segmentation are being focused in the second phase uh, of this project. So optry is used for accessing 3D data in, in a certain way, and morphological segmentation. I'll show you some of the slides. So this is another research paper, which shows you um, extraction of features from a registered point cloud, and which is then manually annotated, and you create a training set. This is then uh, used with a random forest classifier to target to, to be run on the target data, which can generate an annotated 3D point cloud for you. 
So people are trying to automate the process to make it faster, easier, and cheaper. For many years uh, previously, large-scale photographic surveys, they were used to create the first 3D models of buildings, cities, and territories. Now, the fourth dimension of time has been added to it. So the 4D world emerges as a series of sparse, and these are the words of Professor Kaplan and Di Leonardo, emerges as a series of sparse spatio-temporal zones that are progressively connected, forming a denser fabric of representations. The next step is to add on this 4D skeleton information from cadastral maps, layers of BIM and GIS data, connect them to scanned OCR process archives, which can then be articulated, enabling the geometrical computation of hypothetical reconstructions, accounting for a perpetually evolving reality. Let's see how this can be used. So these technologies now they're becoming very accessible and affordable. We, this will lead to scanning of cityscapes at some point, which can be carried out pretty rapidly now. So the periodic scanning can be almost every year documenting the evolution of a city in time as a continuously changing 4D model. In this seminal book, The Poetics of Space, Gaspar Bachelard says, L'esprit voit et revoit des objets. L'âme dans un objet trouve le nid immensité. Loosely translated, he's saying the mind sees and sees again mere objects, while the soul finds the nest of immensity in one the nest of immensity with all its possibilities. Let's take a quick look at this video from the Venice Time Machine Project. So the current concept of a four dimensional mirror world proposes to create networks and pathways that will help us approach the limits of partial arts immensity in objects. It does so by connecting and rendering searchable, extremely large amounts of diverse data. The project proposes a mechanism that would allow us to localize, to zoom in, even pause as we investigate a particular event in time at our chosen pace. To discover the mysteries of a building, a neighborhood, or even a city by unveiling layers of historical data going back centuries. These are the archives, state archives in Venice. This is a 3D scan model. They also use old paintings. Um, to this model. Um, now we spoke about the immensity, Bachelard's immensity, right? But this immensity can only be approached at our human scales, one digital experience at a time. So Rob will end today's talk by walking us through two ways to do so right here at School of Architecture. Okay. We do have a few ways to just actually get into what we're talking about. In the School of Architecture. We have this place called the XR Lab, which is an immersive environment right here in this building. What we can do in that lab is this. If you didn't know uh, extended reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality, well, here are the descriptions. I'm sure all of us or a lot of us have heard about VR or virtual reality. So as a departure point, we can break out into four different segments and experience any and all of those right downstairs. What I have here is a walkthrough and what you would see through the goggles in our VR, XR lab. This is using a software, which is a dynamic render. It's called Landscape 3D. I'm stepping us through uh, what is a student model. It's actually a count of Rhino models um, rendered in Enscape. Um, <clears throat> the students really did get a kick out of being within their project, looking out to their um, 
teammate or classmate's project uh, across the way. But uh, while in the XR lab, I can train you how to walk through your own model, um, provide quality control, and see why that header at the door you just built is at five feet, not at where it needs to be. I'm providing tools here with rendering on the fly, um, seated or room views, or fly like a bird. Pretty much anything is possible. Next stop, we have Unity 3D. Um, this is uh, connected back to the gaming we were talking about here at um, the Notre Dame project. Uh, we can also explore point clouds within Unity. What I'm doing here is I've immersed into the point cloud software called Point Cloud XR. Let's have to show the controls dark in here, but there are controls as you jump into the point cloud. We have control over the point size, where what I'm doing with that slider right there is making points larger. So it gives you the sense of surface within the points themselves. This will step us up into the UP Honors Quad, which is the courtyard behind Carruthers and Littlefield uh, dorms, just on the other side of the campus here. What we're looking at in this view, as we step through the model, is an RGB colored view of the points, and I've exaggerated the points, uh, just so you can see them better. But of course, you have full control of the point size. Um, each point is about 100 millimeters in distance. You can measure, modify the point cloud, and more, most importantly, experience the sense of place within the cloud itself. The reason why I did this was it was during COVID. The students were unable to access the site. And this gave them the sense of place and experience of that site, which was restricted. With that, it's time to check. We're just on time. We go to Q and A. Any questions? Yes. First of all, thank you uh, both uh, Rashmi and Rob for those wonderful presentations. Are there uh, questions from the audience? Yes, Dean Addington. Um, I, uh, does anyone else have questions first? Because I have three. <laughs> okay, I, I might have one. Uh, okay. Yeah, one, one for Rob, one for Rashmi, and one for both of them. So, uh, Rob, uh, I I think the first presentation that I, I saw of this work was three years ago. It was a summer course that you did, uh, and what I it was uh, when you did the uh, the, the Mueller uh, Tower and the Wildflower Center. And what I recall from that, that time was that the, the biggest headache and actually the biggest amount of work for you and for the students was in post-processing. And so I'm really curious, have we seen any kind of sort of sea changes in how post-processing has been developed for this now that it's becoming larger spread? Sure. Um, the gear we had at the time at three years ago um, was what it was, and it was slow. Gear nowadays um, uses object-based image analysis. So, as I said, as if I had that, for instance, within a Mueller tower, I could step through the tower and would capture that into the model of the fly. At the time, also, we didn't have the power to post-process, whereas we do now. So, there's two different um, learning opportunities there: post-processing and registering, indexing, point cloud. Now, for different reasons of other measurement, the art of point cloud or 3D modeling, or if we had um, gear that would capture that on the fly, it'd be a lot quicker. I think it's benef beneficial for students to learn how to connect the interior, exteriors, photogrammetry, and LIDAR together. Um, but nowadays, image based um, information analysis is happening within vehicles within you know, drones themselves and fly over a site, it captures it when it's done, but it also recognizes what the objects are on that site. Whereas during that class, we'd have to register the upper vegetation, lower vegetation, the field itself, and the building itself. Okay. And can I add to that, um, I mean, in historic preservation, when you are using point clouds to say, create a BIM model, the problem that one comes across is lack of libraries. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are uh, people who are creating these libraries. So there's one called Kijazi Architectural Object Library. 
and they are working in Jeddah. So they've taken the architecture of Jeddah, tried to create a parametric model library that can be used for other projects in the region. So this is happening everywhere. Uh, yes, uh, question number two. Uh, and the start to the but I think there's been a piece of this that, that uh, Rob will want to come in on. And this is not about actually part of what you talked about because that's going to be the third question that I'm really intrigued by this object oriented approach to how we sort of integrate with this data. I'm actually blown away by that part. So that's the third question. Uh, this one is actually drilling down. Uh, and I'm thinking about you know, the origins of LIDARs, this next generation from what was developed for Landsat. And Landsat was, was about you know, the scanning to pick up spectral signatures, not necessarily to pick up you know, ge geometric dimensions, uh, because that, that was just sort of assigned to a flat plane, but it was actually to see sort of like the spectral signatures of things in view, which allowed it to do unbelievably detailed analyses of species. Uh, so that, that was, you know, in, in its primary uh, primary origins. This, of course, is about a very sort of detailed geometric location of, of specific surfaces within that. I would think that for historic preservation, the ability to sort of fold in this an additional layer of analysis. So for example, uh, you know, to not just have the exact location of the top surface of the material, not just to have a photograph of it, but, you know, depending upon, for example, how much a material might have been impacted by certain kinds of erosion, which made it more permeable or more porous, what certain kinds of fungi, you know, might be doing materials, or even beginning to understand what the actual composition might be, because it would be very different for certain kinds of pigments. If it was a pigment with, you know, uh, lead for opacity versus other kinds of chemicals for opacity, but that ability to sort of like interrogate mm -hmm. the data for this additional information, and you know, for for those of us who do thermal work, the ability to actually look at infrared. Uh, not on sort of the larger, what we call the radiosity scale, which is how we look at it now, but actually sort of like see direct infrared at, at its scale would, would, would be phenomenal for us. So is there, is there within historic preservation an interest in finding a way to sort of like fold in, whether it's with, it would have to be maybe two different lasers, you know, together, but we begin to fold in ways to sort of like extract all kinds of information with the scan. You want to go on to that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so with scans, sure. I mean, you do use uh, a thermal imaging uh, in some respect, but they also, um, you know, with smart, with the advent of smart cities, the new structures. So those sensors are being used in the surface preservation. At the moment, I've seen them for uh, movement capture. So if something is moving, I've, I've seen uh, them for temperature differences, which also gives an idea of something's happening if it's it's an animal in, in the reading. So that's, uh, it's there, it's coming. I mean, the same structure, how can we use everything to, and that is the basic reason why they interrogate what's happening. That's the monitoring part. But then also uh, monitoring of the surface gives you, and that is where the 3D scans might come into play. The changes in the surface is also due to some reason, but then what is that reason? For that, you might need sensors, if it's movement, or if it's in a uh, change in color, then you have to go and do some other intervention. But, it, but it's all, it will be connected, I think, with the metaverses that we are coming to. I think it'll be connected, but it's also beneficial to be saved by a drone over time, every day, a specific time, scanning whatever that is on the ground and see the changes that happen mm -hmm. thermally, physically, you know, through reflectance and make choices and you know, determinations of what's going to happen to that area. I mean, I think that there's a whole set of algorithms we have yet to develop in order to sort of really realize what we can extract from the database. 
can I do my third question? Sure. Can I follow up on that? First? Yeah, okay. This is actually what we'll of the graduate school virtual children there for your for dissertations and research activities. So given that question and the opportunity to move from geometric to semantic data types, where do you put your energy first? That's the question I wanted to ask. <laughs> 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 so I think in the end, that is what we humans got to it, right? The semantics of it, the subjectivity of it, to understand, because it's just a collection of points with the point cloud. And we are, I mean, people are trying to do that. Essentially, even the technology comes not from historic preservation, but from the field of medicine or defense or industry. So they are tackling this issue. And then we can use uh, that. So I've seen in um, oil and gas industry, they don't even model, they just do point clouds, periodic point clouds, and those are compared to each other. So they can see if a pipe has moved or, you know. And for, to do this, uh, people are working on algorithms, automating the process. No, so I, I know what people are doing. Yeah. I don't know what you would do. Yeah, yeah. If, I gave, <laughs> if I gave you fifty-three million dollars wow. and a you. team of people, <laughs> what would you ask them to actually do to help you in the professional development environment? And which budget do you have actually? <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time hearing. There's so much that can be done. I mean, right now, um, wow. No, I need. If it's fifty-three million, I need to sit down and really think about this. <laughs> well, so but here's the challenge, though. You never know when someone's going to offer you 53 million. So you need an answer before you walk in the room. Right. I think the first question I'd say is 53, can I have 110? Not yet. Show me what you do with the first 53. First but, I like, but I like the attitude. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll go bigger. Uh, 53 million, I think that's rude. But um, I'd want a budget that, you know, we start off in proof of concept and how big can we go? Can we go global? Can we go to another planet? Can we see what it means to you know scan the surface and see the changes over time and have something that's dynamically feeding this database? And maybe they're 53 million. Well, AI is in there too. There's plenty of gear, there's no problem. And there's no limits. But I'd want to see how things change over time, but also take the snapshots as you go. Now, can we go back? Does that thing form the mirror meta universe? Yeah, you're going like on a planetary scale. Yeah, I, yeah, I know. I go back to historic preservation, and when I see in the field, it's not being used as much. So I will try to figure out why it's not. What are the hurdles? I mean, one of them is post processing, the time it takes. Uh, the, ask, the, the interesting issue I've come across is accuracy, because you know, these are just points you can manipulate them. But I've had uh, this discussion with somebody, and the point they made was when you're surveying a building, it's also one person taking the measurement from one point to another. It's not perfect. You're drawing a straight line from one point to another for the wall. So accuracy has different definitions. But um, so, but I mean, there's so much research to be done in this. How can we actually make this valuable for historic preservation? So that it becomes commonplace every day. What are the hurdles in that? So I'll go very basic. Keep it basic. It's a symposium and a conference we need to organize. Yes. <laughs> I yield back my time to Dean for Let's move to Elizabeth because my last question is very open ended as for everybody in the room. Okay, good. I'll ask a question. We'll come back to Michelle. Um, I have several questions that are kind of interrelated. And they have to do with uh, the, uh, more of a theoretical question of what you're doing is bringing what's latent, let's say, to the sur literally to the surface so we can see it and be revealed. Are there any situations, I mean, I think the assumption is that we want to reveal more. We always want to see more. We want to see what we can't see. Are there any conditions where we really don't want to? Like we're assuming we want to see everything. If I get entry, I want to see all of it. So that's one question. Um, and then the other one, what are some of the theoretical questions around reproduction? 
I mean, this has been an old question for decades about, you know, the civil opera, the reproduction. What are the problems with that, the theoretical problems or questions related to that? So I'll leave it at there. I have a couple more, but we might have time. And you don't have to answer them. I mean, you might not think they're good questions. You don't have to answer them if you don't want to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can speak to reproduction, I suppose, but I'm also things you don't necessarily want to see. So where should we start? Well, I'm not, not that you don't want to see, but that we, there's an assumption that we want to know more always about everything. That every, we always want, like there's a, a kind of mystery in not knowing certain things. I mean, you referenced Bachelard, and I think it's a beautiful reference. Uh, but there is something about mystery and even even the word immensity it suggests that it could be beyond you know beyond knowing or uh maybe it's so immense that we can't quite <coughs> ever see it is there any value in that at all or is it that's not so interesting no i, I answer that in two ways one is uh it's who's doing the theme Thematically, I don't know where that is, that's it. But uh, if it's if I were my prehistoric preservation days, I love old buildings. That's the reason I'm in the field. And that's where I would be. I go there, I feel the the ancientness of that building. I feel I can think of stories connected to it, right? So I don't know about it. So that's one phenomenological, phenomenological um, experience. But then if you are a preservation professional, you want to know about parts of the building because you are trying to take care of it. So it's who's doing the scene. And so all the information that we get, we can curate it. And it is always curated. Like you go to a museum, they don't tell you everything about that statue. It's according to the audience. For children, there is a different way of saying, talking about it. So more information isn't necessarily bad. But it's um, how you present it. Can we choose what we want to uh, see according to our needs? That's one. But in that, um, so I had this uh, discussion with an architectural design person. And I was saying, this is something that we should do. And he said, for uh, the sake of insurance, we don't want to use 3D scans because it's, it's, it shows you exactly what we see. It shows you everything. It shows you more than you want to give to uh, the client, or you know. So uh, that was very interesting for me. If you only want to show them what you are not unless, uh, untrue, but still selected information. And so that is another hurdle, and also the uh, return on investment. I mean, the the money that is put into three D scanning and modeling, it's not. Um, I mean, historic preservationists cannot afford it. So that's where probably a model that's selective in its um, granularity that can be that can be helpful. And even when you see well, see everything, it still needs to be interpreted. And there's a bias to what you're seeing, but the machine itself has a bias. It's not just a neutral thing, right? So even when we think we're seeing it all. I think we have to question what are we seeing and through whose eyes, through what lens and what are we seeing mm -hmm. it and how does it get interpreted? Thank you. For that. Yeah, I did answer your second part, but that's okay. okay. We should <laughs> hand it back over. Well, right, because I think this is a really interesting question. An interesting question in so many ways. And it kind of ties into my, my last question, which has to do with, um, you know, we're dealing with millennia of the way that we think about our field because it's you know, the, you know, the tangible physical things that either remain or, or that we're able to, to envision. And you know, I, I was watching the Venice project and thinking very much that uh, you know the, the object-oriented approach is meant to tie in some primary sources, it's meant to tie in you know, aspects about literature and culture, but what we what we are left with is is actually the physical shell of the place, you know, not its society, not not its not its culture, not not the phenomenological 
experience of it. Those, those are the parts that we it, it does not do not render uh, within us. And um, and maybe this ties 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 your question into to my last one that you know if we really were going to fully exploit the object oriented approach of this, you know, thinking about the physical remains as being sort of like the anchors of a scaffold for tying in this other knowledge could be I could I would be blown away you know that that sort of understanding that as a sort of this richness of contingent phenomena and not just sort of like the physical structure um, would be incredible but it would also be exactly the opposite uh, of the way that we teach architecture and we think about architecture that'll be a fantastic challenge to the way that we teach architecture and think about charge one, one of the biggest challenges that we would have had I don't know that it's going in that direction. You know, if, if the idea of the object-oriented approach is with just a tag, you know, tag, you know, additional sort of information or, or reading blocks, or whether we really could invert it, not a mirror, but whether we could really sort of invert and see it, or I don't know if I use the word see, but be, be in it uh, as a human, experience in it, as opposed to always sort of standing from always sort of like dealing with the distance of, of the static object. I know I'm not phrasing it very well, but it, it, it's somewhat similar to, to your question. Right? Because some of it's just ineffable. Yeah. And like the most important parts are ineffable sometimes. Yeah, yeah this reminds me of a project in uh, Cardolfin in Venice. So they use a mixed reality um, headset, with Microsoft Overlens. And there were paintings on the walls previously, which are now in different museums like we saw for the wedding of Kana. They scan them, you scan there with the HoloLens, with the, with the headset, you still see the room, but with a flick of your wrist, you can get the painting there. So you are there in the space, it's, it's augmented reality, mixed reality. But that's still experiencing the physical space. Yeah. You know, that, that, that's not being able to put it into a sort of context of its time. You know, not, not able to sort of deal with what human knowledge, mm -hmm. the, the level of human knowledge uh, and uh, the way that these things are appropriated. Uh, and it still ends up being odd enough, both building centered and you centered in your time. And I, I'm, I'm very interested. It, it is <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> this is like lots of dinner conversations. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. Well, we, we've actually run out of time. I know students have to get. So thank you both, Rashmi and Rob, for a really fascinating uh, presentation and a wonderful conversation that we'll have to continue, yes. obviously. Okay, thank you so thank much. You.